This presentation concerns gout. It gives you some ideas with regard to the basic biochemistry, pathology and pharmacology of gout. And hopefully a platform on which to understand the treatment of the disease and how it's reasonable to expect to prevent long-term damage with this disease. Now, to start off with the biochemistry, let's ask what is uric acid? And uric acid is a salt that is the end product of purine metabolism. And purines enter metabol metabolism through diet and through endogenous production. There are some high purine foods that is worth knowing about, but you will see from the list of high purine foods that in fact, they don't occur in any great quantity in most regular diets. So fish such as anchovies, herring, mackerel, scallops and sardines. Offals like beef kidneys, brain, game meats, liver and sweetbreads. And vegetables such as asparagus, dried beans and peas and mushrooms. The other thing that can elevate serum urate from the synthetic side is increased production through metabolism. And this can be a genetic anomaly, trauma, both accidental and surgical, tumor and chemotherapy all have the common factor of there being increased tissue destruction and tissue turnover, and as a result, increased metabolism of purines and th thus increased synthesis of uric acid. Now, uric acid can also be increased in the blood by impaired excretion and this can occur in renal disease with drugs notably diuretics alcohol and genetic factors again so what happens rna and dna are catabolized and hypoxanthine and xanthine are end result of that catabolism they then are converted to uric acid through the enzyme xanthine oxidase now, these two salts, xanthine and hypoxanthine, are highly soluble and so don't represent uh, a risk of crystallization. Uric acid, on the other hand, is very near to saturation at physiologic levels. So any phenomenon that increases the blood serum uric acid has the propensity to create uric acid near saturation and thus crystal formation. It now, often is a number of factors will cause increased serum uric acid. Crystal formation is a consequence in some people with hyperuricemia. And in those who have crystal formation, the crystals form and are deposited in the kidney, synovial and sub subcutaneous tissues. And it's these crystals that cause the pathology. So the urate deposition in the kidneys cause interstitial deposits and stones and these interstitial deposits are not really clinically evident but they can impair renal function to a limited extent and the stones of course can be anitis for infection or can cause uh, renal colic. Synovial deposition is usually initially asymptomatic and can remain asymptomatic for long periods. If the crystals come out of the uh, tophi or uh, deposits and come into suspension in synovial fluid, then they cause intense inflammation. And these are the episodes of acute inflammation that we characterize as acute gout, initially often in the lower limb joint, particularly the great toe. With progression, however, things happen. There's increased frequency of attacks. There's increased numbers of involved joints and the duration of the episodes get prolonged and the whole syndrome evolves into a more chronic long-term arthritis when left untreated or poorly treated. Subcutaneous tophi can occur anywhere, but usually at sites of friction, such as the elbows, pin of the ear, Achilles tendon, sometimes in the pulps of the fingers. Now, the key to therapy is reversing that process of pathology so reducing uric acid load and you can do this either by inhibiting xanthine oxidase or by increasing urinary urate uh, levels particularly in patients with normal renal function that is a result of reducing the serum uric acid 
and of course when the tophi are down, then in a milieu of reduced serum uric acid, or, uh, then they begin to solubilize and as a consequence they become reabsorbed. So a little about the pharmacology of the traditional urate lowering drugs and how do they work. Well as we've alluded to previously there's these antinoxidase inhibitors and there are two of these allopurinol and febuxostat. Allopurinol has been around for a long time Fibuxostat is more recently uh, available. Allopurinol has a problem of hypersensitivity in some patients, and that hypersensitivity can be as simple as a rash or impaired renal function, but it can be quite a severe illness at times. The risks of hypersensitivity are increased in patients with impaired renal function and increased if the dose of allopurinol that is started is, is rapidly escalated and in ge certain genetic backgrounds are also have an increased risk of hypersensitivity to allopurinol. Fibuxostat doesn't have any particular uh, hypersensitivity syndrome and it is easier to use in patients with mild or moderate renal impairment. The, both these drugs work in the same way by inhibiting xanthine oxidase and solubilizing uh, deposits. The dose, in both cases, one should start the dose uh, as low as possible and then escalate the dose at intervals. Monthly intervals is, is a useful rule of thumb so that there is a period after each dose escalation where the new serum level stabilizes. The smaller the increment, the increase, the less likely one is to provoke acute attacks. And the dose is escalated to target urate levels. And the target is the mid-normal range of your uh, normal uh, urate levels. Eucosuric agents, on the other hand, are less often used. The two commonly used preparations are probenicid and sulfonpyrazole. They can cause urinary stones if the urinary output isn't maintained fairly high in order to keep the urinary uric acid soluble. Uh, they can dr interact with drugs by impairing excretion in particular. They increase urine, urinary uric acid excretion, hence they lower the urate load. The same rules apply to dosing with uh, the uric, uric, uric agents. They start the dose low, escalate the dose at monthly intervals in small increments and the, to the target. And again, the target uh, is the mid-normal range of the uric acid level. Now, in a new patient assessment, let's look at what uh, needs to be considered. Well. Look at the clinical presentation. Has the patient presented with acute monoarthritis or have they recurring monoarthritis? And in which case, note the interval between attacks, number of attacks per year. And of course, the more frequent the attacks, the more attacks per year, the more imperative it is to get the patient started on treatment because it is almost certain that that pattern will continue unless it is interrupted. Involvement of more than one joint and a chronic polyarthritis are indicators, a need for more urgent treatment of the disease. So the history will give you the, the pattern of joint involvement, the time course of joint involvement, and then the, the associated features. And these include obesity, excessive alcohol intake, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. In fact, the modifiable risk factors for coronary artery disease and stroke. And the dietary factors, you need to, need to make sure that the patient has got no dietary fad that would lead you to think altering the diet may have a significant effect on the uric acid levels. Now, it's worth considering provoking factors because this is a reason that some of the strategies have been undertaken. So a patient who has a quick or rapid change in uric acid levels is more likely to get an acute attack of gout because these seem to provoke crystals to become suspended in synovial fluid and to uh, 
cause the acute attacks. So binging with food or alcohol, so fasting as in an illness, fasting as in preparation for or recovery from surgery, fasting as in weight loss that is a bit too enthusiastic. Drugs uh, are also important, particularly diuretics, and the introduction or the changing in dose of diuretics can provoke uh, changes in uric acid level, as can introduction or changing in uric lowering drugs. And in the case of both the diuretics and uric lowering drugs, if the dose is maintained at a steady state, and in the case of uric lowering drugs, it is increased with small increments, then there's less likely to be major rapid changes in uric levels and so less likely to provoke episodes of gout. Nevertheless, when introducing uric lowering drugs, uh, one needs to introduce prophylaxis. At the first visit and subsequently, it's worth noting the sites and size of topi. And in some times, it's also worth x-raying the hands or the feet to determine underlying bony damage from overlying tophi. At every visit, one should measure serum uric acid so that you know the background uh, at which you're treating the patient, creatinine levels so that there's an awareness of possible renal impairment, which will have the, uh, its influence on the drugs and the drug effects and the drug dose. And CRP, because in patients with acute inflammation, such as acute gout, the urate level in the blood will be low and it's only when the patient's CRP is normal that one can be sure that the uric acid level one is measuring represents the true uric status of that patient. So start therapy by trying to control the acute inflammation with anti-inflammatory drugs, colchicine, or sometimes steroids. Start uric lowering therapy quite quickly after the first uh, event and then continue urate lowering therapy even if there are further acute episodes don't increase the, the the dose of such therapy while there's an acute attack of gout underway but don't stop or lower it either start prophylaxis when we're starting urate lowering therapy in order to try and prevent acute episodes of gout and then address risk factors now, it's important to, to understand that if a patient has acute gout, one doesn't want the treatment you're going to introduce for that gout to provoke further attacks. Hence the need for prophylaxis, and hence the need to get the gout under control and then address risk factors. The patient's confidence in you will be shattered if your therapy with allopurinol or uh, uric lowering drugs causes gout. What then about review patient assessment? Well, this the patient will usually be on a plan that includes control of the acute episodes, prophylaxis and long-term therapy. And those three elements need to be addressed at each visit. First of all, look, you document the number of acute attacks, the number of joints involved, and hopefully that number diminishes or goes to zero uh, quite quickly after the introduction of therapy. Then a biochemical assessment for urate, creatinine, and CRP, as I mentioned in the previous uh, visits. And then drugs. Note whether you need to do an incremental increase, whether you need to continue on prophylaxis, and that depends on the target. If the target urate has been achieved, then the may need, you may not need to uh, increase the drugs any further. And if the target has been achieved and there's been no acute episodes for a number of weeks or months, then the prophylaxis can be reduced or withdrawn. The risk factors need to be the subject of education. They need to be addressed then. And then you need to keep the patient informed of the gout and its implications. So you need to talk to the patient about gout, uh, what it is, how it happens, what provokes acute episodes and how you propose to treat it. You then need to look at other health issues as well and look at the patient's other factors like obesity and 
alcohol intake, metabolic syndrome. There is little value in telling a patient on the first visit with gout to lose two stone and stop alcohol. First of all, they're unlikely to do that. And second of all, both these things are likely to provoke acute attacks and so be counterproductive. More likely, more better if you get the patient's confidence, control their gout, and then slowly start to reduce their obesity and uh, to modify their alcohol intake. The success of therapy depends on the patient complying with your treatment and your treatment being in accord with the principles of treating the disease. The patient needs to know that there's a need for therapy and needs to see that the, the therapy will be effective. So these few thoughts with regard to gout, I think should help you understand the disease, help you with your approach to patient's treatment and help the patient's gout get under control in a disease that is, after all, one of the few diseases in rheumatology that is curable. Thank you for your attention.